first question. You have spent over 25 years in prison among the 17 who were convicted for the gruesome acts of murder on the fort. In the first interview, you did explain your role in the process. However, the first question I will throw at you today in this our second engagement is this. Tell us the kind of feeling which runs through your mind every October as you are forced to look back at this event which many regard as the blackest period in our modern history. I'll tell the truth. I'll tell you the real truth. Because I better like to deal with the truth. There is nothing, not even my mother or father's death or brother's death that have affected me. Like what went on in the, or the food in my lifetime. It is the worst that I experience in my lifetime. Especially when I get to know the truth of what happened. Because I was kept in the dark. Nobody at all told me the truth of what went on. Not an officer, not a soldier. No other guy who was in prison with me told me the truth. As I told you before, I learned the truth after I came from prison. And when I came home that day, George, after I learned what really happened, I was not myself anymore. Or till today. Because I cannot understand. I cannot understand. How? Men who say there was comrades with one another could have lined up men, the two leaders and founders of the revolution, and give men from the same army guns to shoot down the leader, the two founders, Ulysses White Man and Morris Bishop, and many others who took part in the insurrection with me on the morning of Master Teeth. And when I say many others who took part, I mean people like Pope Helen. He went to Tubla with us. Huh? George, sometimes I don't even like to talk about it. I don't like to talk about it. It's so gruesome to think about. It's so ugly. It's so nasty that I don't even want to. Sometimes people ask me questions about it and I just tell them, well, look, we talk about that another time. You know my feeling. Then boys grew up as boys together. I'm older than them, but we grew up as boys together. The family was so close. So close. His uncle is my grandfather. The so close. But bullet is a relation to me. I related to all the bullets. Keith Pop and Helen used to come in this house as a son to me. I sure used to see him driving my car. Yeah? And without authority, people who had no authority at all to execute people, line them up and execute them. But people are saying, if People are saying that if H.A. had taken a different stand during the crisis, the results might have been different. A different stand during the? That if you had come out clearly in support of Morris. Oh, I did that. People are saying you didn't support Morris. Well, the point is, why do I say that? I told you the situation with the letter from the Central Committee. And a letter from the Central Committee is always supposed to be unanimous. I didn't know it was a letter in my mother had gone. I thought it was truly a Central Committee letter. Because I respect that kind of thing, George. Remember, I was just back in the country, you know. I was just back. He was the Deputy Prime Minister. I was six weeks out of the country. And I was just back. So, in other words, you, you were not privy to the discussions? No, I was not pre Why do you think I'm staying in the vote? I didn't know what was going on. When I left Canada, George, 
There was no such thing as a talk about joint leadership in Kenya. You know? Normally, if people have these kind of things, something is circulated for discussion or it. Okay, General, let me ask you this. What was the reaction of the other men of, of the 17th to some of the revelations you made in the first interview, in which you told the Grenadian people quite clearly for the very first time about the role of Bernard Code, whom you described as drunk and intoxicated with power? Well, that, is, that is what he always talk about, you know. State power. They might not paranoid, paranoid about state power and leadership. Paranoid about that. Everything is state power and leadership. That's all he wanted. But what I was asking you, what kind of reaction you get, what kind of reaction you got from the other 17 now that you have exposed certain things about the revolution. Some of them I have not seen, some of them I have not talked to, but um, there's others who say, well, boy, you see the truth as you know it. And nobody can fight you for that. Quite a few of them call me. And they say, well, it's you, boy, as you see it as you know it. As you get it. Because what I'm saying was given to me by an eyewitness who was there. On the foot. On the foot. She was there. She saw everything. She was a soldier. Okay, General, I have read an article in the recent days from Terry Marshall in which he made the statement that finally Hudson Austin and also Ian St. Bernard have now come out publicly and told the nation that the collapse of the Grenada Revolution and execution of Bishop and the others were done as part of this naked and vulgar grab for power by code and its ultra-leftist clique within the party. That is true. Okay, did it shock you that code would have used that period as the PRG was starting to put plans in place to mark the fifth anniversary of the revolution so he could have executed his plan to become Prime Minister of the country. Well, uh, Code is the one who planned everything together with his top boys. Because this whole joint leadership thing, he set it up to get some of his men to call for it. I didn't even know that. To call for it. And using the, 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 the thing that they join Maurice strength and Bonad strength to set the revolution. This is what they are saying. This is the when I discuss it with other members of the party. They say this is for instance I didn't even see, I never seen that document. This document that they put out for this joint leadership thing. I've never seen it. When I left Grenada, I had no such thing. What heart? That was done behind my back. And a lot of things was done behind my back. Okay? Even the morning of March 13th, even the morning of March 13th, we were supposed to meet with boys. We were supposed to meet with boys. I know who squashed it. I know what happened. I know the, the demonstration went up there. The demonstration went up there. March 13th or October 19th? October 19th. October 19th. October 19th. Right. October 19th. You will correct me. You will correct me. Even that morning, we were supposed to be to mass. And but I had so. But the talk went out that, and I, I, I understand so, that Bernard had a beaten by his house with he had a click. And they were shouting up, long live the revolution in my head over there all night. Because they don't even write that to Morris. And then, next morning, this rumor went out. They said, oh, Morris say that Bernard and Phyllis could want to kill him. That's the rumor. Right. What happened then is, 
The demonstration came up there and the people take my side and go with them. Because I understand that the men in the gate had orders not to open the gate for my for, for people going inside it when people bring down the gate and go in. But the soldiers did not shoot at the people. Which is a very good thing. Because there was always too a lot of fire on ground. That was part of the training. Not to fire on the people. Not to fire on the people. Okay. So what happened is this rumor up to today, we don't know if themselves spread the rumor or what. Because I want to ask you the question. Did you believe Morris Bishop was the one behind the rumor? that Code and his wife were planning to kill him? I cannot say directly, George, what is what. But I went to see Boris Bonner, the very mother, and she was heartbroken. Because a woman by the name of which she called Marcibian was there. And she told me what Boris said is true. Bernard and Phyllis is planning to kill Boris. Well, see me and tell me that. He said, I know what will make Boris believe it more is what they did the night before. Which was? Which was? What they did the night before the meeting they had my brother shouting out and going on. But a lot of people were invited to that. Only Bernard and his boys were there. I didn't know nothing about it. The next morning when I went to see Boris, he tell me what went on. So he said, oh, they didn't invite you. He said you was, they had a big security meeting, they said, well, you wasn't there. He's supposed to be the head of the army, and there was a big security meeting, but you wasn't there. They deliberately left, they deliberately left you out. That's right. Not immediately. He knew what, but I didn't want to tear out. Now, at the height of the crisis in 1983, you alluded to it that delegations from the NGM Central Committee were sent to meet with Bishop, yeah. who was under house, house address at Mount yeah. Welldale, to try and resolve the crisis. Yeah. But it was noted that Eche, who had a very close relationship with the Prime Minister, was never among those who were on the delegation to meet with him. Why were you not part of a delegation, since you were known to be close to the Prime Minister and could have played a key and pivotal role in helping to ease the tension and possibly save the revolution? I don't know what you said, delegation, to go and meet with them. But I was not invited to any meeting at all. I believe St. Bernard and Lane were among the part of the delegation who went to meet with Morris. Well, like well, boys, all of them, one of them, well. Now, when Bernard Cole resigned from the Central Committee and the Political Bureau of the Party, I think it was in 1982 or thereabout, it was my understanding that the late George Louison then became the chief ideologue in the NGM and was doing a relatively good job. There is a feeling that if Louison had remained in the job, that Code's usefulness would have either operated or not. And so he had to stage manage a comeback with his disciples to fulfill his long time ambition to be the Prime Minister and take charge of the Grenada Revolution. What say you, H.A., to that? Well, I'm good. It's a manipulator. And he do anything I suppose I would not he do or would have done in order to be the Prime Minister. That bad, the least chance he get, he would denounce Morris. Oh, Morris can't guide the process and this and that. So, nothing that he do, or had done, or would do, would surprise me. Nothing to get power. Nothing he did would surprise me. So he would make these kind of statements about Morris to other comrades? Yeah, I heard him making one. I heard him making a statement to Lydon and Daddy one day, saying that if imperialism have to come, 
They ain't coming for Boris, they're coming for him. Okay. H.A., General, one other school of thought that I have heard is that Bernard Code had to make a bid to seize power as soon as possible as Maurice Bishop was consolidating his power and prestige as leader of the process yeah. and that Fidel Castro was scheduled to visit Grenada on the occasion of the fifth anniversary of the Grenada Revolution which would have coincided with the official opening of the International Airport and we all know that Maurice was referred to as Fidel's political son not code what say you on this theory? That is correct. You could put it more correct than that. That is why they try to jump for the joint leadership thing before the opening of the airport. The opening of the airport would have coincided with March 13th, 19th. Uh, 19, you, you said, you're talking about 1984. 84. Would have been the 5th anniversary. Op the opening of the airport, so that would have been in March 1984. So they wanted to be in place before Fidel come. Yeah, they, they wanted the joint leadership before Fidel come and all of that kind of thing. And before the opening, because you know, the kind of popularity that Morris would have developed after the opening of the airport. You, you could understand. Mm -hmm. There are bunker people that would have been down there. From all over the world too. From all over the world. A lot of revolutionaries from all over the place. Um, the Caribbean. And not only revolutionaries, but people in the diaspora would be so glad. That Canada get to the international airport. But when they want to come home, look at me. I got in it, but it was five o'clock one evening. I could come home. They put in a no light in it. Five o'clock, you know, the same. I do overstay a night and a day in Barbados before I could come home. Because Boris called me while I was in, 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 in Czechoslovakia and tell me I'm leaving home. So I got home a day late. Eche, as, as you reflect on the bloody October events, what do you think could have been done by the leaders that was not done in order to save the Grenada Revolution? The only thing that could have been done to save the Grenada Revolution you have to get some magnet to put in Bernard brains to get to get leadership out of his head. So what you said? He had to put a magnet in his head. Well, telling him, telling him he's wrong. Because he could he could see wrong no way. He, he like a cow that bolted when he when he see it. Because I proved that to him in a lot of ways. He would just want to go in people's ministry and do things. Don't consult the minister consult. He is not the type of consulted leader. He's a kind of bulldozing leader. Right? He is a Stalin. He's a Hitler, that kind of people. That kind of person he is. And nobody telling me no. You experience him? I experience it. Because we are a big getaway. Move on that. Meditate twice. He just fired one of my engineers and fell out call something to from, you know that doing? From David, you said. From St. David's, working on the Eastern Bay And listen, I experienced what I had called greed for power. Early in the game. Early in the game. I experienced that. I don't know if other comrades experienced it, but I experienced it. Starting evil. Before we made the revolution, how we were to try to control everything, even before we made the revolution. And when he do certain things, he says certain things have to be done when they need to know. If a person don't need to know, you don't tell them. You understand? Mm -hmm. They need to know. That was one of the main strategy and tactics. We're not telling certain people certain things because they don't need to know.
Okay, Eche, you know all the players who were involved in the NGM leadership. Many people were surprised that someone like yourself and Selvin Strong, who were very close to Maurice Bishop, deserted him in the end and supported the court side in the battle for control of the party. What do you think caused Sello, as he was called by many, to move away from the Prime Minister and into the court camp? Well, I really cannot say. Because you know that a poor hungry fella. You know that a poor hungry fella. I don't know if, because you know all the talking boys. Okay, let's start. Okay, okay. I don't know, because you know that I do always talking with boys. And I don't know if Cello is certain thing with boys that boys will be slapping down the water. I don't know. I can't see. If I try to see because he was a fellow like. I like and he was always a man for doing things properly. And I'm going to tell you, Salo himself did not know the men was executed on the food. He did not know until after. The need to know was kept away from him. He didn't know. But Salo was making statements twenty four hours after on the radio uh -huh. in which he was saying that Bishop Morris had teamed up with bourgeois elements to overthrow the revolution and he had to be dealt with. Cello was saying that. I didn't know the answer, so I don't and know about that. But a tip in which Cello was saying that. And as a we matter of fact, I don't know if he was referring to Brad Bullen and them, but he didn't call names, but he said bourgeois elements. As a matter of fact, after the event on the fourth, there was an emulation ceremony which Selvin addressed the soldiers. And he was praising people as inculcate. Selwyn was down Se there? Selwyn strong. He addressed them down there in the fort? He, he addressed them, I'm not too sure which fort. Oh, uh, the fort in Richmond Hill. It could have been Richmond Hill, I'm not too sure which fort. But there was an emulation ceremony I don't after know about the that. killing of Morris. And Selwyn, Selwyn addressed it. And he said he was praising inculcate. And he said inculcate the machine gunner. As being part of the firing squad to liquidate Morris, Selwyn was saying so. I did not even do what well, George was ever here that. I have a copy of that tape. I know Peggy Nesfield also have a copy of that tape with Selwyn's own voice saying those things. I like to get that. I like to get that copy of that because I did a story on that tape already some years ago. How come Selwyn was in jail with me? And he never, the very best you want to tell him, he never told me a thing about that. I did, for, well, first time I knew John about that too. About they had a, a, a emulation ceremony. A emulation ceremony for the ex execution squad? Well, not, I wouldn't say for the execution squad, but uh, emulating some soldiers. And he said when addressed the emulation ceremony, and he made those remarks. You see? I wasn't and this is there. True. I wasn't there. I, I didn't invite you to trust it. They were not trusted, they do cross the bar. I want to switch focus here and look at some of the dark side of the revolution. This is the end of part one of The General Speaks. The British government was offering scholarship to men who only have diplomas in construction. Mm -hmm. British government, Commonwealth, was given these scholarship in England. And while one morning, MacDonald, I don't know if you know MacDonald from St. Paul's Day, he used to be in public works. MacDonald, he was a content. He was acting assistant permanent secretary, right? in public works at that time. And he called me one morning. Say, Austin, I think I have something here that I'm going to say. And he showed me that the British government was offering these scholarships to men with diplomas to give them a bachelor and master's degree. And he said, I think you should apply it, Austin. 
He said, okay, come in and I'll show you how to do deal with the mm -hmm. foam. Mm -hmm. So I went in and he followed the foam and so on and so on. And I set it up. And I will accept it. But, apply for leave. And when I see the leave was up, I went back to McDonald's and he said, well, I can't approve that kind of leave. See. But when they approve the leave, you know what they did? They gave me three years leave, study leave, but without pay. Yes. So, here I was home now. They gave me study leave without pay. But it so happened that there was an organization in England called the IRA. They say they used to do a lot of bombing in England. I don't know if you know about those Even things. The Irish Republican Army? Eh? You talking about the IRA, Irish Republican Army? Yeah. Yes, uh huh. There are a lot of bombings. A lot of bombings, yes. You know about There's that? Civil war going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what happened is, they get to know about all these students coming in. But a lot from Africa, they are there. And they, in their own image, said that the British was bringing in these people to spy on them. So they threatened to bomb the university. Mm. So the university, I think, was, the name was Reading. Reading University. Reading? Yeah. So they postponed the scholarships. Postponed them. And they said, well, so when I got the letter postponing the scholarship, I go back to McDonald's and I'll show him. And I waited, 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 waited. Then one morning, the secretary, Mr. Rahim, was the secretary, called me. And she said, I still. They said, they have no post for you right now. You know. <laughs> that politics again, eh? Because at that time, I joined the JNP party. Right? But you know, at one time I was organizing secretary for the JNP party. I didn't know it. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was politics played. Well, boy, there is no salary. Barred that I had two children already. Had no salary. So Magdala said, hey, should look for something to do. He said, you didn't refuse to work. They refuse to give you work. So you're still a public servant. He said, wherever you go and work, you are still a public servant. He said, you have to live. So if somebody offers you a job, take it. One morning I was there by the fish market. They don't even have a fish, fish market uh, by uh, Empire City Money. We used to sell fish there. Yes. I was there, I was seeing the brothers come with fish. Then I went fish. I went to buy a few, few pounds of red fish. I have to sell a bunch of food. So he said, so what are you doing with my fish? So all the money should be there doing the people work. I said, I said, Mr. Secretary, I had no work, you know. The people will take me back to work. He said, well, I'm looking for a debit manager, man. You want a debit manager? He said, come in Monday morning. And I said, I get to go and work with British America. Yeah. So I went to work for British America. And I remain a civil service all the time till the revolution. Mm -hmm. But you were not getting paid. But what happened is, they never sent a letter inviting me back to work. Never did. So, what happened is, I worked for a British American for about two years. 
And I saw an advertisement from God Buffett in Lansapil for who did you do? And I applied. I got a job with Buffett. So all the development on both sides of the Lansapil Road, I did that. Oh. I did that. Even Freedom Hill. And then afterwards, the same Pat McLeish, Cleveland Donald and myself, we form a company called Wood Construction Company. And it's from doing those work there, the other side of the road, no one did that for Joshua Todd and them, what they call holiday development. Right? And it's from there, the revolution comes. Right? So it's from that point, all the men were trained on top of that hill there, overlooking True Blue. Right? <laughs> Oh, so we come into the politics now. Yeah? We come into politics now. Yeah. How did you first get involved in politics? Huh? How did you get involved in politics? What what influenced you to get involved in the political life of the country? Listen. What? I look at how the Gary government was working. Mm -hmm. Because I grew up poor, eh? I know what it is to poor. You know we had a little pick up house there too by the road there? Eh? Yes. Right. And I look at the things Gary got, was doing over the years. Because some people think I, because I don't go on the wrong boosting, some people think I'm stupid. Even in the Jewel Movement. I joined the Jewel Movement in the early days with the Universal White Man and everything. Even before Maurice come back and before Bernard come back. The early day, Teddy Victor and Sam Batson. That, that, that would have been the Jewel Movement. Oh, yeah. Not, not New Jewel. Before yet. the Jewel Movement, I joined the GNP Party. I remember the GNP Party. That would have been late 60s and that kind of thing, right? And then the, you had this border with Robert Blaze and all of that. But I never one day decided to run for no election. Robert Blazer they wanted me to run for election to them though. So they put God to it because they say, I'll campaign for somebody if you put them, but I don't run for no election. So when you run for election, everything you people have to take, you'll get it because of government ticket. I did that one. So that only first only election, remember God to Edicard? I remember he ran. Yeah. That was in 1972. He, he lost to Robert William. <coughs> 72. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then again. In the 76 election, I told my shit. I say, if you run it, I'll campaign for you, but I'm not running. Right? I ain't looking for no power, I'm looking for help for the people. Right? So, the politics side of it was because what I see was going on in the country. Tell your shit. I didn't have you what Gary was doing. The first thing I gave a vex with Gary. Gary used to, I used to listen to Gary from the very beginning when he came in. All the 51 strike, I think I was a young boy. And all them kind of thing. And listen to him, he used to come by some way and I'm beating up late the night. Yes, are short, repeated. I'm talking about how the people need homes and the children could see what mama and that daddy doing it at night and that kind of thing. Then when he had a chance now to give the people a good little home, what do I give them? A stick house. A little stick house from Soledad. Right? You're talking about the, uh, the Janet house you're talking about? I said that. Uh, yeah, he could have done better. He, he, could, uh, he could have done better, better <coughs> than that give the people a good little house. A little 14 by 10. This room bigger than it. Because this, this room is 16 by 16 by 20. <laughs> right? The next thing I gave a vex with Gary. At one election, a lot of spoiled votes. A lot of spoiled votes. And Gary realized 
If he continues so and he smiles once he could lose the election. In Senegal, mobilize the party to teach the people how to make a proper X. You know what you do? You go in Parliament and pass a law and say any man could do. That one piece well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That one piece well. Can I say, how the hell a man with a statue of Gary could want to keep the people ignorant? The next thing I ever mixed with Gary, he used to have the poor people making harvest for it. Harvest, eh? mm -hmm. They take their money and they buy things and they make harvest and sort of over the nighting bass and collecting money. Those things piss me off, John. If I tell you them things, they piss me off a lie. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That is what twists me against Gary. I like him as a person, eh? I tell you a lie. But for a leader, uh -uh. I as a young boy who struggled to get an education and fight up, I know for what I did, Gary could have done better for his people. Could have done better, much better too. You think he kept them poor so he can control them? That's right. Keep them poor so you could control them. Why keep the population ignorant? Okay. You see, that is one of the reasons I told Boris. After the revolution, George, Boris called me in. And he said, H.A., what is the first thing you would like to see we do in Grenada as a party? What, what is I say free secondary education. Free secondary education. Although we had it in the manifesto. So I tell Boris, boy, we had a lot of bright little young boys in the place, but the parents can't afford to send them to secondary school. The work the parents do it, for instance, like a man walking on the road, in those days, how much are they getting? Even when I walk in Lansapin, even when I go to walk in Lansapin for Buffett and them for a lot of them, carpenters will still get it $5 a day. I didn't know that. Look at yeah. mm -hmm. Next So how, how could, I mean, how could these things happen? How could, it, how could people bake their life with that kind of money? And normally poor people always have more children than other people. Correct. You might check it out in Bordello. It's correct because... Um, check it out in Bordello which you have the most children. Poor people. Okay. Rich so people have one or two children. In Guinea, that's still, still the case in Guinea. Yeah. It's still the case. Yeah. All right. So, H.A., how did you meet Morris? Because Morris? I know you had a very close relationship with Morris. How did you actually meet? Well, meet actually meet Morris? Yes, how you met him? Let me tell you now. It's always had close relationship between Morris and my family, family and my family. Let me tell you now something. Morris' mother, Morris' father and my mother went to Bordello Primary School together. They for Bordello, right the way you see the Bishop of That is um, Yeah, by the hill. The bishop on the next side. Yes, um, what was his name again? Um, bishop. Roy. Where are you, Bishop? Where used to stay. Bishop used to stay. That was family house. Bishop. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, Boris born in Aruba. When Boris come back home, the, mm -hmm. he mostly used to be in Bajalu because his father didn't bail house and things. And then afterwards they bail on parade and all. His father would more business and all that. Boris used to be in Bordello every Saturday by his grandfather, Fred Bishop, who used to work in the poetry, government poetry. And Fred Bishop and my father had good relationship. So when Fred Bishop around Christmas time, and he knew he could be working late, he used to have coal. He used to have two coal. Because he used to 
He used to buy milk. He used to get milk for his family, right? And when he going on, what he call the father? Hey, Phineas! Let the boy begin to cow for me. I'll be late tonight. So I would go and bring it his cow and tie it on the other yeah, guy used to go and cut grass for him and put it on the pen. I would bring it the cow and tie it for him then. And me and my boys on Saturday morning we hope he had a lot of lands there. Always in the Anglican church it was there. So go right back up to Gibson. Gibson Corner. Mm -hmm. It bogged you with Gibson that go right back down to Springs. <laughs> right? We we'll sell out some of the land in the bottom of it, all of that. So, that is how I get to know Morris. He was just that about nine years old when he came back. I'm older than him. Right? And Morris would come there by his grandfather and mother is me looking for. We're going to do Margo. Remember, the coconut tree could have too tall for him to climb in. I climb in anything. We pick what I don't. I never forget one Sunday morning. It was a Sunday morning, yes. I go over here. When we go down that hill, rain fall, boy. I couldn't climb the coconut. I couldn't climb the coconut because there are a lot of coconut trees at the bottom of the I said, we can't climb this morning, boy. She's too wet. You said, let me cut it down, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings the relationship between me and my son. And that relationship only parted mainly, let me tell you, mostly when he started going to secondary school. Let me tell you something. I used to be a boy boy in the Richmond Hill Club. Tennis court? Yeah, the Tennis court. court. Okay. Yeah, I used to be a boy boy. And boys living right below the, in those days we saw a battleship coming in. When the battleship come in, them sailors, officers, used to rent the coat. Like they would rent the coat for a few days. And read the ball boy at home. I think. But them, when them sailors come and they want to rent the coat, and them come and they play till about 11 o'clock, they're gone. They've been coming back till, till, till about 4 in the evening. So when them gone, the coat is behind Morris and them other boys. So that's the boys love to play tennis. <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. So that was the relationship between us. Mm -hmm. It was something that we pick up by the way. Boris' uncle John is my godfather. Because my mother was very close to the bishop. Okay? Okay, so that if you bring me now to the next question I want to ask you. What influenced you to get involved with Morris? What influenced you to get involved with Morris and Eunice Whiteman um, to start that struggle against Gary and um, his girl. I mean, at what you know, what 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 influenced you Let to me get tell you. involved with Let them? Let me tell you something. The struggle all started because. How Gary was appointed. Remember, Morris and Yuri and them didn't start together. Mm -hmm. I got involved with White Man first. They started the jewel movement. White Man, Sam, Bad, Steady, Victor, Hemkarate. Right. And it was. They started off this thing to educate people. Well, well, J.E.W.E.L. Joint Endeavor for Welfare, Education, and Liberation. So, they were doing this thing to educate people towards politics. They started a library and all those kind of things. People could have come and get books and read, all well, that thing. And because Eunice the white man who was teaching them thought it was not a good thing just to push people into politics without educating them. Right? And I got involved with them because 
la carga que hace no puede GNP, right? Because uh, how what brain does a fella? You tell him something and he's like he'd go to one day and go to the next one, right? So I switch. I went over with which you will. And then when Morris come back home, he started something called BAP. Movement for the assemblies and people. Well, Jewel and BAP come together on the 11th of March, 1973. Because it makes us have two organizations that have the same, that serve the same purpose. So Morris and you we come together and then uh, Robert Vida Estate, or Estate in St. David's Day. What name is again? Not in, is it? But up the hill, it used to be the Nettles Estate. Robert Vida, Robert Vida, what name is it? It's in St. David's. Huh? It's in St. David's that happened. Huh? In St. David's? Yeah. Okay. St. David's. And they met there. Because I think. I that Sabbath or somebody had somebody who was in charge. Mm -hmm. And they met there and the two organizations joined. And we call it New Jewel Movement. Then when the new come in. It's when Morris joined in with us to get the name New. Right? New Jewel Movement. Right. And the the one of the first big struggles we had was Rasha Jess. That was Lord Brownlow. Eh? Lord Brownlow. Lord Brownlow. Because Lord Brownlow wanted to one walk up the pasture where they see they have they know where they played all the games yeah, and things yeah. you know. He wanted to walk up the pasture to plant banana. Well the pasture was given to the people by the first estate owner uh boy neighbors can I remember his name now? And he didn't only want to do that. But he put gate so that the people can pass to a place to go to the beach. And then people make up their mind. Make up their mind. You don't put up with that man. They are like English man coming all the way from England, buy a state in Green and then beat certain condition there, and then tell us what. The people have to go all along so to the food which pick up they want to go on the beach. Ah, well, we say that. We're going to deal with the global. <laughs> so that is all we We had a big demonstration. The people will move the game. They move the game. Right? Well, I, 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 I was the one who delivered a sentence on him. Right? You were a trial. Yeah? A trial of Robert. Yeah, the trial of Robert Blue. Blue. Okay. I was appointed the judge. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how mm. we declare him posted on Gata. Mm -hmm. Right? That was the first big struggle. Then they had the airport struggle in the. the, the um, it's good, Will. Okay? So that was how, I, how, we, how it all started out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it moved from one to the next, one to the other, one to the other, because they, 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 they lock us up for the burglar thing, you know, don't forget. Oh, they didn't lock you? No, I didn't know. They, yeah. they didn't lock you all up. They did, police did arrest you all. Yeah. And take us to court to it, then. Mm -hmm. Did you all win that case? Huh? Did you all win the case? Yes. Okay. You okay. win the case. Mm -hmm. They didn't go for that anybody the court. This brings us to the end of part two of the interview with General Hudson Austin. Part three of the interview will be aired in approximately two hours. Hudson Austin now addresses the failure of the NJM-led People's Revolutionary Government, the PRG, to keep its promise on the morning of the making of the March 30, 1979, revolution to hold elections in the Spice Isle. The general was also asked a few questions about the current Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Mitchell. Let's go back to the interview. 
Okay, I want to ask a very important question. It is said that one of the failed promises of the revolution was the holding of election. And that yeah. if Morris had held the election and got endorsement as prime minister, it would have made it very difficult for Bernard Code to make that grab for power to become the prime minister. That is true. That is true. And I think one of the big things is James Holden election. The big persuade I did to the election was the very simple support and good. That he wasn't ready yet for the election and all this kind of thing. So that was the line he was pushing in meetings? Yeah. We didn't ready yet for it. We didn't ready yet for the election when he was ready to declare NGM a communist party. You see? You see the kind of nasty this is? When I tell you about a cook and a schema, every loophole he get, he manipulated. General, let me ask you. And anything I tell you, you don't have to be afraid to publish it, you know. Because I don't care too damn about anybody who feel I say things about them. Nothing has been said about me falsely. Things I do, but when they go all over the world about her, I don't know about execution. I know who planned the execution. You know, will you ever hear anywhere in the world? You're going to line up people and execute them. And a whole set of people looking around. Because the soldiers and the fort were witness to the fact. The very soldiers who carry out the execution. They did not know what they were doing. They feel that was all that they were supposed to carry out. They were made to believe that, which was illegal. So in a proper court, these guys would have proved innocent. That is why when I called, when I talked to Paul School in one inquiry, and Paul School himself did one inquiry, because if the inquiry had come up, he paused, couldn't have to answer why he inv uh, invited America to invade. We are a Commonwealth country. We didn't invite members of the Commonwealth to come in. The Queen's still on the dollar. We still taking allegiance to the Queen. In another time in England, he would have been hung. But school would have been hung for the dollar. Let's shift a little bit. General, to the best of your knowledge, was the current Prime Minister Keith Mitchell ever been a member of NGM? Who? The current Prime Minister Keith Mitchell, uh -huh. was he ever a member of the New Jewel Movement? I understand, so I don't know so. I understand in the early days he was a member of the New Jewel Movement. But I don't know so, because I never beat him in any meeting or anything. I knew Keith Mitchell during the time of the NNP, when he ran for NNP, I campaigned for him. When he ran for an NNP the first time. But after that, I knew he was working in an office and took and then he went away. Right? No, but during the revolution, Keith Mitchell was branded as an agent of the CIA and often accused of being involved in plots with people like Stan Cyrus to bring down the Grenada Revolution. Was this just old talk by the PRG? Or you are credible intelligent that he was actually engaged in clandestine activities outside of Grenada to overthrow the Grenada Revolution? I will do that. I can't say so. Nobody has shown me anything to prove that. You can't get cut up and label people like that. I don't keep me tell man, we are very good friends. Very good friends. You mean now or back then? Well, I ain't no enemy with keep me tell up to now. The only I don't just make people enemy because people say things I'm worth it. I don't do that. I just don't do it. So I, 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 I take it that you did not know of... I never know about that. Nobody never give me proof for that. Um, and, and that's why I don't deal with that proof. Now... Keith Mitchell has become the most successful politician in terms of winning elections in Grenada. You've been around long. How do you rate him in terms of leadership alongside Gary and Mark Bishop? 
Keith Mitchell, I will think, is a good leader. I will think so. Let me tell you why. He seems to, about, to be a man who likes to consult people on what he's doing. Not a dictator. Right? I listened to him a few times on this COVID thing and his persuasive way in trying to get people to take injection. I think he had been very good at that level. But I, certain things, I, I didn't like how we deal with certain things, like how we deal with the civil servants, the teachers and so on. You know? I like how we deal with them. And that, that is one of the big things we had more and I got away for, you know, in the early days, when we had to get civil servants and so they increased. I almost want to fight a war with civil servants. I say, we, I don't think the revolution should go for that. You know? I, so, myself and Morris, I don't know it was the next person, I think it was Kojo, had a meeting with the nurses. And George, I tell you, they are lying. When I, through the revolution, when I see the, the salary the nurses were working for, and I wanted to allow the hell to live in. The nurses and the teachers and the prison officers and even the police. I wanted to know how they live in. Um, Eche, are you surprised now that so many leading figures in the revolution teamed up with Keith Mitchell over the years to help him win so many elections? Cleta St. Paul? Peggy Nesfield, your good friend Einstein, Joe Tata, and the list goes on and on. Yeah. So much revolutionary figures teamed up with him when the revolution used to accuse him of being CIA agent. Team up with who? Keith Mitchell. Well, I'm not surprised at that. I'm not surprised at that at all. Because Keith Mitchell has a position side to him that a lot of people don't know. Right? Face to face, he could be very persuasive. Very persuasive. And you see, Keith Mitchell is not an arrogant fella. He's not a bad code. He's not a angry. He could have some very arrogant side to him. Keith eh? Mitchell is not that. Even Robert Blaze had an arrogant side to him. Eh? Even Robert Blaze. And I'm telling you, I know the leaders are getting it. Huh? Not only what blames to evil, uh, tell about tell us. Could have a very arrogant side to it. What Keith Mitchell is not, he might appear to be so, but face to face he's not an arrogant person. The people have branded him a dictator when it comes to NMP business. I don't know about in the party who oh, yeah. is, but. But sometimes you have to be here, you know what I do? If Morris was a, a, a little more one dictator, he would have been dead today. Fair enough. Actually, I want you to clarify something. Now, I remember in the crisis, um, there was one central committee member who was not in the country, Chris Riggs. And it was reported that the party had sent him outside on a mission what? to explain. Chris Riggs was sent outside on a mission by the NGM leadership to explain to fraternal parties. Uh -huh. The crisis that was taking place in the party. That was his mission. Do you know anything about that? Who said about Brad? I'm just I'm hearing, I don't know. I'm asking the question if you are aware of anything like that. George, I want you to know. There's a lot of things that take place in the party and in the government that I was not aware of. Anything that fall on them is a cool and them jurisdiction. Rusted out. And I tell you that to the whole, I make that private. That was still out. Also, Ichi, I've heard that, you know, Morris had gone on this trip to Eastern Europe and he came back in a Sunday. Yeah. But Trevor Monroe uh -huh. had came into the country, it is alleged, was holding consultation with Cole. And Tr Morris came in the Sunday, Trevor left the Monday, what I'll say in a word to Morris without meeting with him, but he only met with Bernard Court. Well, you have to understand that Morris wasn't very keen 
continue to achieve what we do. And they stand up politics. Right? Even though Boris went for revolutionary politics, I don't think Boris wanted the country to shift from its path of development. We take aid from Cuba, we take aid from it, we continue with our system. People do that all over the world. You take help. Look, look, look at somebody or the other countries getting help from China, help from here, help from there, help from there. But well, they change the system. What Bernard Cohen wanted to do was to change the system in there. So do you think then that there was ideological differences between Marx hey. and Bernard on the way forward? Hey! There was an ideological war. You call it ideological war? Yeah. Because listen, as I told you, Bernard Cohen wanted to declare AGM the Communist Party of Canada. Could you see that happening? In them times, then? Hey, Chay, I want to take you to something. We're coming close to the end of this interview. In the last interview I did with you, when you talk about how you were captured, and I said to you, I understand that um, you all were trying to get a boat to take you all to Guyana, and Jonah was the person involved. Somebody who listened to the interview said to me that um, you all had wanted Jonah to take the boat from the Lansapine area and bring it around to, to the Western Hall Point where you all were staying in a house somewhere there. And it was from the Western Hall Point. You all had planned to move out of Grenada secretly, but the Americans had captured Jonah, and Jonah spilled the beam. Where will you go? That's what I'm told by somebody who said Jonah told them that. that well, that's total nonsense. Total nonsense. Total nonsense. Listen. Your country is being invaded. Your country is a little too by two country. Even the head of a military eye for invasion. You think you can invade this little tiny island and you go see a boat leaving the island. And what will happen? You don't let it go? You don't know what it's going with? But if you see the little boat do that side, a little, little thing here. Yes, but it's not his boat. You all wanted him to go and take a boat, a bigger boat, from... Yeah, no, I don't have that sense. Do you think I did my left to finish? Well, we'll see that they don't, they, they don't see what I don't really know. Okay. okay, General? You have just been listening to part four of an interview with former Army Commander General Hudson Austin. We are nearing the end. Just one more segment to go in The General Speaks. We will be back for the end of the interview in the next hour.